Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Well, today I want to let you know that our website has been redesigned. Uh, you can check it out over at greatdetectives.net. And our web designer, uh, Jennifer Moss, did a really good job on this. The big thing that I wanted to do, and I actually received an email from someone who said, you know, it is too hard to find all of your other podcasts. So now at the new Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at greatdetectives.net, you can actually go to all four of the other uh, podcasts we do that are related, all four of the related podcasts. And she also went ahead and added a uh, graphic that goes over to our YouTube channel right along the side. So I appreciate the work she did on that. And you can check it out. Enjoy it at greatdetectives.net. And if you're interested in sending any business her way, just go over to mosswebworks.com if you like what you say. Now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, November the 3rd, 1951. And this one is the Hannibal Murphy Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Trabert returning your call, sir. Oh, yes, Inspector. Thanks very much. I wonder when I could talk with you about the Hannibal Murphy death. Well, at your pleasure, sir. Do I understand you've come all the way from the States? Yes. The news broke yesterday, and his insurance company thought I'd better... The reports weren't quite clear on whether or not it was accidental. Then you haven't heard. Only that he somehow fell off a cliff. Oh, then I hope you'll pardon my being a bit nonplussed at your timely arrival. Mr. Murphy's death was definitely not accidental. Examination this morning revealed a bullet wound in his head. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Hannibal Murphy matter. Expense account item one, $264.80, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Kingston, island of Jamaica. After checking into the Myrtle Bank Hotel and reporting by phone to the British Constabulary, I went over late that morning and met the officer in charge. Well, Mr. Dollar, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Inspector Traver. Although news of the death of one of your countrymen is hardly the kind of invitation I should like to send you. If it hadn't been Mr. Murphy, I probably would have been invited to a murder someplace else. It's a popular pastime. What do you know about the Murphys, Inspector? I understand he's survived by a widow. Yeah, there's a brother also, Paul Murphy, and a stepdaughter, Felice. Oh, I didn't know about them. You mean they're all here in Kingston? Yes, the brother has lived here for the past two years, has a cottage just outside town. The deceased and his family were visiting him. They'd been here for two months. Anyone else? Two servants, an old cook and a young man who has rather general duties. Do you have any kind of a theory, Inspector? Since the fact of the murder was proved only this morning, no. Except that it was murder, the position of the wound in the head rules out suicide. Any suspicions, then? Uh, no, none that I wish to voice at the moment. Perhaps you'd like to visit the scene of the crime, or rather the point from which the body fell into the sea. Thanks, Inspector, I would. Like most British police officers, he was playing it close to the vest. But on the way, he did let me know that he considered the Murphys, including the surviving brother, to be people who had been spoiled by too much money, were completely selfish, and quite possibly could be hated by a number of people. After a drive of a few minutes, we left the car and crossed through a strip of shaded parkway to a bridle path that paralleled the cliff some hundred feet in height. At the bottom, breakers piled in against a jumble of coral and rocks. Here we are. 
we wrote the section off in case we might learn something from the marks, though I doubt we will. There, you see, on the edge, the torn earth and the broken branches. Yeah. His body was found below. Huh? Yes, it was discovered by a young islander who was searching for shellfish at an early morning low tide. You said the Murphy Cottage wasn't far away. Can you see it from here? No, it's beyond the trees there. The path turns inland before it reaches the grove. Does this cliff run near their place? Yes. I believe so that you and I share a common bewilderment. Well, if his killer met him here, why shoot him if he could have been pushed over the cliff and killed that way? Huh? Precisely. We should have had a devil of a time proving it was murder at all. Unless the killer wasn't strong enough to get him over while he was alive. Like a woman. A possibility that does present itself, doesn't it? Yes, if he'd been shot and fallen here, then dragged to the edge, there would have been signs. But there were none. No bloodstains. Nothing. Yeah. So unless he was shot somewhere else and carried here... We must visualize the victim and the killer standing side by side on the sheer edge of the precipice, gazing out to sea a moment before the shot was fired. Can we go to the house now? I had planned to wait until I had a more complete report from ballistics, but please feel free to pay them a visit if you wish to. Thanks, Inspector. I should let them know I'm here. Uh, Very good. Uh, Come along. I'll drop you by. The theory that Murphy was shot someplace else had holes in it, too. If the idea was to dispose of the body, why dump it so close to his home? The mail servant answered my knock and told me Mrs. Murphy was resting and left me on the veranda while he went to find out if she'd see me. A few seconds after he'd gone, I met another member of the household, the daughter, a plain girl with short hair, gangling figure, and troubled eyes. Matt, wouldn't he let you in? He thought I'd better wait out here. What do you want? I came to see Mrs. Murphy. About what happened? Yeah, I'm afraid so. My name is Felice. I'm her daughter. I can let you in. Oh, thanks. You're an American, aren't you? That's right. My name is Dollar. You've come here because of what happened to my stepfather. Why did you? I was sent by his insurance company in the States. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. I suppose he left a lot. He always did everything so handsomely. It wasn't an accident, you know. He was murdered. Somebody shot him. Yes, I know that. I suppose it'll be all sorts of trouble now. Police will come and ask all kinds of questions. Well, things like this are never pleasant. Are you worried about answering questions? Of course not. Why should I be? Just the way you mentioned it. Well, I'm not. I'll tell them everything I know and everything I thought about him. I'm not ashamed. Police. I had a right to hate him. Police. Stop it. Stop talking that way. It's true and you know it. Every awful thing that ever happened to me is his fault. He was filthy rotten. Stop it. <laughs> go to your room. All right, I'll go. But you won't be able to send me away when the police come. I'll tell them. Get out of here. Yes, Mother. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. She really doesn't mean what she says. I'm terribly sorry. You don't have to be, Mrs. Murphy. But an outburst like that to a perfect stranger. I don't know what you must think. I think she's a pretty upset young woman. But she has no right to be. She's been an extremely difficult child. I don't know what else to say to you. I'm I'm terribly ashamed for her. Now, would you come into the drawing room? Thank you. Please, sit down. You are an insurance investigator, Mr. Dollar? Yes, and if you feel up to it, I'd like to get as clear a picture as I can of what happened the night your husband was killed. I imagine that I shall have to put up with it, shan't I? Sooner or later, yes. It probably would have been easier if your husband's brother were here to take part of the responsibility. Oh, he went to make arrangements for flying my husband home. I'm not sure when he'll be back, but... I'll help all I can. All right. First, Mrs. Murphy, do you have any idea who could have killed your husband? Not the faintest idea, Mr. Dollar. You'd been here in Kingston for two months. Is that right? Yes. Could your husband have made any enemies during that time? Did he mention anything like that? No, he mentioned nothing. We've been about very little. We only met a few people, some of Paul's friends. But he couldn't have made any enemies. Who was here the other night? No one but Hannibal and Paul and Felice and I. And the servants, of course. Did your husband leave the house? Yes, of course he did. It's 
quite a strange question, Mr. Dollar, considering where he was found. I'm sorry. Why did he leave? Paul said he was going to take a walk. He was in the house when I went to my room. What time was that? A little past ten. And Paul retired a short time later, and he remembered that Hannibal said he wasn't sleepy. Perhaps he would take a walk. And I take it your daughter had gone to bed, too? Yes. Do you mind if I talk to her now? Oh, I'd rather you didn't. Why? Do you suspect her? I didn't say that. Do you? Of course not. A mother would hardly suspect her own daughter. Why don't you want me to talk to her? Because she's a poor, unbalanced girl who's filled with warped hates and misunderstanding. She'll say dreadful things about Hannibal. And about me. Things that are absolutely not true. She'll have to be questioned, Mrs. Murphy. Of course, I realize that. Well, there's nothing more I can say. I'll show you to her room. But Felice wasn't in her room. I found her waiting for me on the bridal trail along the cliff. She'd been crying. I heard you say you were an investigator and I wanted to talk to you again. I knew I couldn't and I saw it here. Oh, glad you did. I don't know what's the matter with me. I shouldn't have said what I did. I meant it when I said it. No, I don't. I don't think I know quite what you mean. I'm awfully mixed up. The doctor tried to explain it to me. When my real father died, my mother was all I had. And when he came along, I thought he was stealing her from me. I thought I didn't didn't have anything anymore. How long ago was that? It's been three years. I was 14 when they were But he did take her away. He chucked me into an old school and went off on a trip. I know he didn't do it just to hurt me. But at night it would seem to me that he did. I tried to get over it, but I never could. That's why I'm glad he's dead. That's not a very wise thing to say, Felice. I can't help it. Do you have anything else you wanted to tell me? No. I wanted to explain why I acted the way I did in the house. I don't suppose you understand. Part of it, I think I do. Quite a few children have to adjust themselves to step-parents these days. It's tough, and some do it better than others. I haven't done it well at all. Now I won't have to try anymore. I am sorry for the way I acted. I want to help you everywhere I can. How do you think you can help me? I'm not sure yet. But when I am, I'll let you know. All right, Felice. I'll be talking to you again. I didn't know then what this strange, mixed-up girl was driving at. I got the impression that she wanted to talk more than she had. But I was fairly sure the way to bring it out was to wait rather than press it too hard. I checked in with Inspector Trabert, and his reactions were about the same as mine. On the strength of them, he called Paul Murphy into his office that afternoon. The last time I saw him was when I went to bed. We'd had a drink together, and he said he wasn't sleepy, and thought he might take a walk. Did you know how long after that he might have left the house? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I was dead tired. I went right to sleep. Was he in the habit of taking walks at night? Sometimes, yeah. But you didn't hear a shot? No, I didn't hear anything. How much time passed, would you say, between the time you left him and the time you were asleep? Oh, not more than 15 minutes, Inspector. Uh, then he could not have left the house before, say, uh, quarter past 11. Yes, that'd be about it. And you're sure he didn't say anything about meeting anyone? He simply said he might take a walk. I'm not quite sure that I understand the importance of these questions. Uh, the importance of it is this. Your brother was killed by a twenty-five caliber pistol fired at quite close range. I'm afraid we must assume that if he did not meet anyone, somebody either accompanied him or followed him. You mean you suspect someone in my house? You're only stating the facts. Someone was with your brother. We've ruled out the possibility of a robbery motive since both you and the widow have stated that none of his personal effects are missing. You can see how the thing narrows down, Mr. Murphy? Yes, I can. I don't know what to say. Do you mean that you suspect someone? No, no, I don't. If you do, Mr. Murphy, it would be to your advantage to come out with it. I'm afraid the duty of making accusations is yours, not mine. A commendable statement, sir, as long as you don't mean that you're withholding information. I'm not. I have no information at all. Very well, Mr. Murphy, you may go. When 
Paul Murphy left, we both felt that he, too, was holding back, that it would be a long time before he offered any information. But we were only half right. He phoned the office a few minutes after he had reached home. Yes? Have you called in your own doctor? Uh, Dr. Drummond, yes, I know him. Uh, We'll send one immediately and come out ourselves. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Well, the stepdaughter attempted suicide. How serious? Mr. Murphy was quite beside himself, and it was hard to know. What did she do? Slashed her wrists, a method that is really successful. But the question is, why did she do it? We will return you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Later this evening, the gangbusters give a graphic illustration of what happens when the police hunt a criminal who is a perfectionist. When a gang leader leaves no stone unturned to commit the perfect crime, there's a rough manhunt ahead for the police. Here are the exciting developments when you tune in gangbusters later this evening on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Inspector Trayvon and I went right out to the Murphy residence, but were held back from Felice's room by both a private and an official physician. The latter was the last to leave her room. Well, Doctor, how is she? Uh, You can see her now. As you might expect, she's in a highly emotional state. Yes. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar, Dr. Gurley. How do you do, sir? Dr. Gurley, is she going to be all right? Oh, yes, I think so. You didn't do a very good job of it, I... I think she needs a good psychiatrist. A very good one. She's evidently needed one for a long time. Did she say anything to you? No, nothing specific. Only that she hates everyone. Well, I wish you luck, gentlemen. I've got to run. Uh, thank you, girlie. Bye, doctor. Good day. Well. Yeah. Miss Murphy, we've been told we could see you. Don't call me Miss Murphy. That's not my name and it never has been. Hello, Felice. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Who's he? You remember me, Inspector Trabert. I spoke to you yesterday. I hardly remember yesterday. I hardly remember anything I don't want to. I want to forget. What do you want to forget? Everything. My whole life. It's been a waste. Nothing's been right. I hate her. Please, Miss... I don't care. I'm going to tell the truth. What is the truth? They killed him. My mother and Paul, I saw it all happening. You were a witness to the killing? I saw what was happening here. I saw what was happening in England last summer. At least I was glad. I thought he'd go away and I'd never see him again. Police. Then we came here and I knew it. If it weren't him, it would be somebody else. I knew it would never stop. Police, hold it. Slow down. I'm afraid you'll have to be more specific, young lady. Do you mean that the marriage between your mother and stepfather was not a happy one? Started last summer in England. She was getting tired of him. I heard them fighting and calling one another names. They tried to hide it from me because they knew it would make me happy. But I heard them. She wanted to divorce him and he wouldn't let her. What happened the other night, Felice? I knew what was happening here, too. I heard them arguing the other night after they sent me to my room. Then I heard Mother go to her room. Then they left the house. Your stepfather and Paul left the house? Did you see them leave? Yes. And then I heard the shot. What time did you hear it? Do you remember? Yes, I remember. It was quarter past eleven. I remember because I was lying in bed, awake. And when I heard it, I sat up and I turned on my lamp. And I looked at the clock. Then I turned the lamp off again and went to the window. And in a little while, I saw Paul come back alone. Why haven't you told us this before, Felice? I don't know. It was awfully mixed up. She's my mother... At first, I thought I should protect her. And I thought of everything she'd done to me. She never wanted me. She threw me away. She's never been a real mother. I've always hated her. That's why I'm telling you. Because I hate her and I want her to be punished for everything. I shall expect you to repeat this in the form of a sworn statement, Miss Felice. I will, but you've got to take me away from here now. I can't stay here, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what they'll do. 
The girl was moved to the police hospital and later that day repeated her statement under oath. At about the time she was doing that, there was another development. Inspector Trabert received a call from the proprietor of a second-hand shop that specialized in fishing tackle and guns. Uh, after you, sir. Good afternoon. Are you Mr. Innes? I am. Inspector Trabert. Oh, I thought you were police when you came in. This is Mr. Dollar, an American investigator. How do you do, sir? I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Innes. We want to thank you for phoning about the gun. Well, I thought it was my duty. I've uh, I've been reading about the murder, and when this chap came in here to sell me a pistol what was the same caliber as the missing weapon, I said to myself, you up to the phone and tell the police. Uh, could we see the pistol, please? I've got it right here behind the case. Here we are. Uh, wait a moment. Have you handled it much? Handled it? Of course I've handled it. I had to look it over before I paid him for it. If this is the murder weapon, I'd like to protect any fingerprints that might remain. Uh, l- let me pick it up. Hmm. A Webley, Mr. Dollar. And it's been in England. Would you recognize the man who brought it in, Mr. Ennis? I think so. There's not much trade in guns here, you know. Fishing gear, mostly. I think this is the first gun I've bought in six months. Yes, yes, I'd remember him. Uh, would you describe him, Mr. Ennis? I'll try. He was about my size, I'd say, a, a little heavier. He had what you'd call brown hair. He was tan. Is he English or American? He was English as I am. Well, thank you, Mr. Innes. It's possible you may be called upon for identification. Happy to oblige, Inspector. Uh, but uh, what about the money? I paid four pounds for that pistol. In view of Felice's sworn statement, Inspector Trabert was forced to make an arrest. So for the last time, we return to the Murphy residence. And I shall have to remind you that anything you say may be held in evidence against you. You mean that you're arresting us for Hannibal's murder? There's nothing else I can do, sir. I have a statement given under oath to the effect that you and the deceased left this house together the night of the murder. That's not true. That the sound of a shot was heard and that you were then seen returning to this house alone. That isn't true. There's not one word of truth in it. I didn't leave the house with him. Can you prove that, Mr. Murphy? What? Alice, you know I didn't leave, don't you? Of course he didn't. Can you prove it, Mrs. Murphy? I understood you to say you were in your room, that you went to sleep immediately and heard nothing. My daughter made that statement, didn't she? Under oath and before witnesses. But she lied. I told you she would, Mr. Dollar. She'd do anything to hurt me. You've got to believe that. Alice, wait. What did she say was my reason for killing my own brother? Because of your love for his wife. Oh, she's insane. How can you believe these things? You're men of intelligence. We're men who are used to working with evidence. A sworn statement is admissible evidence unless it can be proved false. Neither one of you seems to be able to do that. Paul! I don't think we'd better say any more until we've legal counsel. No, I won't let her do this to me. We can't, Paul. I think she killed him. She hated him. She's the only one in the house that had reason to That's kill him. no good, Alice. What are you going to do with this, Inspector? I shall have to take you to jail. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't. Will you give us a few minutes to get ready? Of course. Come on, Alice. <laughs> Go get your things. Everything will be all right. What do you think, Inspector? Well, to be quite honest, I'm not sure, but I know my duty as a policeman. The strength of that statement and their innocence or guilt are up to the courts to decide. Less formally, though, it's a pretty frightening thing to think of. If that girl and her mental frame of mind could suddenly decide that she was a witness, make a sworn statement, and bring all this down on two innocent people. Yes, I know, but the fact remains that they have absolutely nothing to say in their own defense. I've got to arrest them. The widow and Paul Murphy were taken in, and I couldn't get out of my mind the strength of the case against them as far as the Crown went. A strength built on the fact that there was no evidence and were no witnesses to refute Felice's statement. I suppose that as far as the insurance angle went, my job was done. But after I left Inspector Trabert, I went to the hospital to see the girl again. Hello, Mr. Dollar. How are you feeling? I feel awfully lonely. They rest Mother and Paul. Yeah. Then I'm all alone. She'll never want me back now, no matter what happens. 
She never wanted me anyway. I'm glad I did it. If you told the truth, you have nothing to worry about. What do you mean? I've nothing to worry about. I mean, if you told the truth, you did the right thing. But if you didn't, you've done one of the worst things anyone could do. Of course I told the truth. You believe me, don't you? That doesn't make any difference. The inspector did. But you do, don't you? You don't think I was lying, do you? I hope not. You think I could make it all up? You think I could do a thing like that? I hope not. I couldn't. I know what you're thinking. I told you how I hated her and how I hated him. But I could never say the things I said if they weren't true. I could never do a thing like that. How did you happen to see the two men leave the house together? You never really explained that. I was looking out the window. I thought you were in bed. Not then. You saw them leave, then went to bed, then you heard the shot, then you got up again and went back to the window? Yes, that's right. Was your light on when you saw them leave? I... no. But you turned it on when you heard the shot? Yes. Then you turned it off and got out of bed and went back to the window? Yes. And who did you see? I told you, Paul. You were sure it was Paul? Yes, I was sure. Why were you sure? I saw him. Why were you sure it was Paul? Why didn't you think it was your stepfather? I knew it was Paul. Because I had a feeling that something was going to happen. Don't ask me any more questions. You better get used to them. The defense attorney is going to be asking the same kind if this gets into the courts. Well, I won't bother you anymore, Felice. I guess you're tired. You don't believe me, do you? I told you. It doesn't make any difference. As I mentioned, the matter was out of my hands by that time, and I was sort of 50-50 on believing the girl. I made my plane reservations on my way back to the hotel, but... When I asked for my key, I got instead a message to phone Inspector Trabert. When I did, he told me, A, that the 25 caliber Webley from the shop was the murder gun, and B, that some prints on it had checked to a known criminal who had confessed the shooting. He asked me if I wanted to come over. It's an incredible turn of events. Raises this perfect hob with the girl's statement in any case we thought to bill from it. Yet on the other hand... Oh, here... I should like to have you meet Mr. Roy Church. What are you doing back, Copper? You beat it out of me, so now you've got it. You dropped quite a bombshell into this, Mr. Church. Tell Mr. Dollar in your own words how you came to kill Mr. Murphy. Why should I? You've told him, haven't you? No, I doubted he would believe me. I'd like to hear, Church. His ruddy brother said he was going to pay me to do it. Paul Murphy? Yes. Promised me 500 pounds, he did. Paid me 100, and I waited two blinking weeks on that clip for his brother to take his walk. And I got Welsh by the dirty beggar. That's why I had to sell the pistol. Tell him why, Mr. Church. I was supposed to take this here Murphy's wallet to make it look like robbery. But he fell over the cliff when I shot him and I couldn't reach him. That'll be all, Mr. Church. Thank you very much. Think nothing of it. Well, Mr. Dollar? Well, this means there isn't a word of truth in that signed statement, except that maybe she heard the shot. She didn't see the men leave the house or pour them back. She didn't know anything. Yes, a rather spiteful statement, but fortunately true in content. They did have the man killed. I don't know what to do about that girl. What would you do? Well, luckily, I can leave the whole mess in your hands, Inspector. But I wish you'd come up and work a nice, simple Hartford murder with me sometime. Do you good. <laughs> Expense account item two, same as item one, transportation. Back to Hartford. Item three, miscellaneous expenses, $204.80. Expense account total, $734.40. Remarks? I can't help wondering what would have happened if Felice's sworn statement had been entirely false and the widow and Paul entirely innocent. I wonder if they would have been hanged anyway. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures Technicolor production, Silver City. Featured in tonight's cast were Eric Snowden, Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Ben Wright, Charles Davis, and Dan O'Hurley. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> ¶¶
This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Lovers of fine music are already familiar with the strong, melodious voices of the choral ears on CBS Radio. This is to remind our many Sunday Night Choral Ears listeners that this excellent choral group will be heard at a new, earlier time on most of these stations starting tomorrow. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately on most of these same stations. And remember, those lovable rascals Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, I think it's definitely natural, particularly the way that Edmund O'Brien's Johnny Dollar is written, that he would be concerned about the possibility of uh, false testimony, uh, particularly when he begins to see things in the story that don't really add up, even though uh, he sees uh, logic to how the uh, murder uh uh, was alleged to have been committed. This does have an interesting twist on a trend that I'd mentioned that I didn't particularly care for usually. And that was when we would have an episode where we would spend the entire episode looking into a crime. And then it turned out that some other person, you know, brought on at the end that we don't know about actually, you know, committed the crime. So we wasted a bunch of our time. But in this case, bringing in someone who was hired to do the killing uh, kind of does have that little bit of surprise in it, but it doesn't feel like we've wasted the, you know, whole of the investigating time either because uh, one of the parties that we were investigating uh, was actually behind hiring the killer. Well, I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And thank you to Heidi, Patreon supporter since a March of 2018, currently supporting us at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support, Heidi. And that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for The Silent Men. And then we'll be back next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.